everybody to our webinar, sarcoidosis survival checklist, uh, symptom management, and uh, health-related quality of life with Dr. Leslie Sakaku. I'm Mindy Buchanan. I'm the Director of Patient Programs at the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research. And I'd like to thank our sponsors for this webinar series, Boring or Ingelheim, uh, for their support of our educational webinar programming this year. So with that, I will stop sharing for real this time, guys, and turn it over to Dr. Sakaku. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you. So uh, Mindy, I hope you'll jump in if something's uh, not going right, like something's not visible, etc. You should see my full screen now. Is that pretty much the case? No, I don't see it. You don't see it. Hold on. Let's try it again. Uh, Da -dum -bum -ba, da -dum -bum -ba. I knew something wasn't right. There we go. Now we see it. <laughs> Between the two of us, we'll get it today. <laughs> yes, it's always exciting times at the FSR, huh? <laughs> well, it was wonderful to be here today, and thank you so much. And we're going to be covering today sarcoidosis survival checklist number two. And we're going to focus on sarcoidosis symptoms and health-related quality of life. And these are disclosures um, and some additional support that helps us fund our other work. And once again, just to remind everybody that the sarcoidosis checklist series is dedicated to a much admired friend and colleague, great colleague, uh, Rodney Reese and a wonderful human being. Um, we miss him every day. Um, and he was part of the work that formulated what we're presenting in the checklist for the most part. Or, and uh, so, so the series, this is what we had last time, the uh, minus the self-advocacy bit, which we'll probably have again. Online recording is there in the ever expanding FSR video library. And today we're going to address symptoms and health-related quality of life. A little bit different than what I had anticipated, but in an effort to be responsive to what seems to be an urgency communicated by, to me by Mindy, that patients really wanted a session that was pain-focused. So, um, so we kind of modified what, what this presentation would be. And then upcoming, navigating medications in sarcoidosis and self-advocacy in sarcoidosis uh, in the future. Um, and Mindy might have a better idea than I do of the timing of everything and the order of everything. And remember, as we're going through and talking about symptoms, that in the library, the FSR video library, are uh, the a host of other videos, including one that's dedicated to understanding fatigue. So our objectives today is to recognize that as symptoms drive health-related quality of life, we'll understand a little bit about, more about what health-related qual quality of life is, recognize that symptoms are modifiable, chronic symptoms, and of course, acute symptoms, hopefully, and symptoms can be, and this is very important that we'll keep reiterating this concept is that symptoms can be related to sarcoidosis directly or indirectly, uh, could be medication related or could be related to something else, something that's not sarcoid or sarcoid medication relation, related. And this is really important for somebody living with sarcoidosis to keep in mind all the time because sometimes Healthcare providers are dazzled by the, the, the disease. When, you, when, when, when someone tells a healthcare provider, especially in a, um, a high stress situation, like the emergency room, that uh, you happen to have sarcoidosis, um, folks tend to get dazzled by the diagnosis and everything can easily be attributed to that diagnosis when what's going on may be urgent and may be life-threatening, but may have nothing to do with sarcoidosis. So it's important to be seen as an a whole human being. Um, we're going to pay attention to pain, cough, pain especially, cough and breathlessness, and uh, a, a few other symptoms. Um, we will be looking at 
red flag symptoms and attention to skills development. And this is really the crux of what today's talk is about, is being able to develop skills over time that, that one can recognize what they're experiencing and then how to convey that, how to relay that, and how to best use you, your time that you have with a healthcare provider so that you can get the best out of that experience. Um, and again, attention to skills development, um, especially in terms of communicating pain, because this seems to be a really important um, request by the FSR patient community. And then again, remember that everything that we do, everything that we learn is cultivated over time. It's applied in our life over time. And um, I, it would make me sad if anybody left here thinking that these were finite skills that needed to be learned. And then if the next time you had an appointment with a healthcare provider, that you didn't complete all the steps that, that you ended up feeling badly about yourself. That's not the point. These are skills that are learned over time and they're practiced and it's a frame of mind that's cultivated over time. So um, always treat yourself with kindness and support. Um, so a lot of what we're talking about today is encapsulated in this article for which also Mr. Rodney Reese was a co-author and it relates to health-related quality of life and sarcoidosis in, a, in addressing the, the diagnosis and the diagnosis of complications as well as the management of the disease and complication and how to improve health outcomes. So what is health-related quality of life? Well, health-related quality of life is in the end, it is probably the most single priority of, um, of patients, regardless of health condition. It is the quality that we have in our life and the ability to interface um, easily in important life areas. Health-related quality of life is also a scientific measure. So if anyone here is part of a clinical trial or has ever been part of a clinical trial, you may have filled out questionnaires that try to capture the, your degree of quality of life and how your degree of quality of life changes over time. And those are, um, those are scientific instruments. So the burden that contributes to whether quality of life is high or whether it's diminished or diminishing um, can be can be parsed out into uh, a few different areas. Physical burden is one, and those are the physical symptoms that we feel, the impairment that we can feel. Maybe uh, we can't move as quickly as we used to because of shortness of breath, or um, we can't speak full sentences or as freely as we'd like to because we start to cough, or um, um, perhaps um, we're very fatigued. And so we don't feel like we can get up and be in uh, our circle of friends or with our family as easily as we can be. So there's that realm of physical um, symptomatology that can contribute to uh, health-related quality of life. And this, these symptoms that we experience physically, they can be either related to sarcoidosis itself, or they can even be related to the treatments that occur with sarcoidosis. So for example, if we consider something that unfortunately lots of people uh, take for far too long, which is prednisone and steroids, um, steroids can really impact our sleep, uh, can make us feel really jittery, um, can cause problems, like changes in appearance. And those are a physical burden and that impairs our quality of life. In terms of psychological burden, this is also, uh, can also be the 
the case that a psychological burden can be related to um, sarcoidosis driven issues themselves, such as situational depression or um, feeling concerned about one's future, um, the long-term future, the uncertainty that living with a chronic illness or an uncertain illness um, carries with it, short-term uncertainties. Am I going to be able to make it to the bank today because my coughing is so bad? Um, those things like that. And also the psychological burden that comes also with treatment. Again, I'll bring up prednisone. Um, oftentimes prednisone is something that affects our mood and really interferes with how we react and interreact, um, interrelate with our family members, et cetera, and impairs sometimes our ability to focus. And, and so, this symptomatology, physical symptoms, psychological symptoms that are either direct from the disease or from, the, from treatment or are indirectly related somehow, um, can interfere with the things that we love to participate in, things that are important to us, like our family and how easeful and easy we can be with our family members um, and our friends, the things that we love to do, um, uh, especially if, for example, you might love to paint, but um, you may be physically too fatigued or you may be um, emotionally too fatigued to do, to do those things, or your joints may be so painful that um, you really can't even begin to think about setting up an easel. To, to paint, but, but painting is something that gave you such pleasure in your life. Um, and physical intimacy is another area of participation. Um, and then very importantly is employment. Um, how are we staying afloat financially and how are, our, how are our symptoms impairing the degree to which we can remain financially solvent and protect our future? financially. And this includes our ability to carry out our work, how many days that we're at work or not at work, um, and how well when we're at work, um, how, how that impacts our performance, our ability to focus. Um, so, so when we look at symptom impairment, we're looking at physical, psychological, emotional, and cognitive. Um, and again, I'm just reiterating, because this is really important. It can be related to the health condition in question, in our case, sarcoidosis. It could be related to medications, or it could be related to something completely different. Um, and remember, again, I will say symptoms, impairments are modifiable. That means we can, we can make them less intrusive, we may be able to resolve them, so we're free of them, um, but they're modifiable, usually, somehow. Um, yes, so, um, and the symptoms that we will be focusing on mostly today, symptom-wise, physically, physically, physical symptom-wise, breathlessness, feeling winded, cough, fatigue, mobility impairment, pain. And in the psychological, emotional realm, we'll be focusing a little bit on depression, anxiety, fatigue, um, and cognitive dysfunction. It's problems with focusing and thinking. So this is a chart that you will find in our um, article. And what this shows is these are influencers of um, health-related quality of life. These are core components of health-related quality of life. And on the left side are factors that can diminish health-related quality of life. And on the right side are things that if we can improve them can help increase our quality of life. So again, these are the participation areas family life that are, these are important life areas, family life, 
the ability to care for oneself and the ones we love and our home, um, our emotional well-being, psychological well-being, um, our ability to um, interact socially and participate in things that give us pleasure, our work life and productivity at work, and our fatigue levels or our, our energy levels, our vitality. And so if we look on the left side of this slide, we can see that when we increase the symptom, when, when um, symptom burden increases, when we have a lot of symptom burden, if our symptoms are progressive, if, if we lack easy mobility, um, if we have a lot of side effects from medication, if we're not um, engaging regularly in physical exercise, or if we're experiencing the financial impact of taking too many days off of work or having hospitalization events, um, and, and we really feel the burden of the uncertainty of our health stat status, um, or we not having an easy time communicating with our clinician, who we feel is the is the connection to um, getting our help, getting help for relieving our symptoms, and um, any impediments to healthcare access. All of these things weigh way down on to um, our level of quality of life and diminish our sense of quality of life. Um, and the more that happens the more likely we are to feel depressed, the more likely that our fatigue is likely to worsen. It's a vicious cycle and we'll talk a little bit more about that. However, as our access to healthcare increases and we, have, we feel like we have a good line of communication with our healthcare providers, our knowledge of disease is getting better and how to navigate the disease is getting better. And we feel that we're getting appropriate um, therapy and in, um, more we're engaging in exercise, um, we're using devices to help us in, with mobility if we need them, and um, we're, we're learning how to cope with any impairment that we have that may not be changeable, but that means we're increasing our mobility even though we do have to use perhaps an aid. But all of these things help to increase the uh, magnitude of quality of life and freedom that we feel in our life. Um, and which includes developing um, coping skills. So over time in quality of life science, there's, there's quite a few important things that we've learned. So um, if we're thinking about symptoms, we can consider symptom distress. Now that can be physical symptoms and that can also be psychological symptoms. Anything that makes us feel bad, that makes us feel alone, that makes us feel more isolated. Um, these, these are symptoms that carry distress. And, and we, can dis we can discuss the degree to which these symptoms impair us as symptom distress. Um, and we know that if we intervene with symptoms, both physical and psychological, for example, even if it's situational depression, uh, if we treat depression, we know that um, we can improve somebody's quality of life. If we can help somebody to stop coughing so much, we can increase their quality of life, a physical symptom in this case. We can improve quality of life. And in a number of various health conditions, we've noticed if we've, if we've applied interventions, even antidepressants, uh, so you know, many people just shrug off these concepts related to mental health as being our own problem. But we know that if we enter even situational depression um, uh, and, and we maybe even intervene with six months of treatment on an antidepressant, we can improve somebody's quality of life. And that intervention, and it has been demonstrated, can increase one's survival. And that's um, that's been mostly demonstrated in literature related to cancer. Um, and, and when we improve quality of life, we, we're more able to tolerate treatments that can um, make us feel better as well. So for example, if somebody cannot really tolerate the dose of methotrexate they're on, sometimes having access to anti-nausea medication um, might be able to increase that tolerability and the ability for somebody to be able to stay on the medication 
we'll talk about that more in, in, in another part of this series. Um, okay. So, so, we're, so when we're thinking about quality of life and we're thinking about symptoms and we're thinking about the symptoms that cause us distress, there's, there's a corner of empowerment to think about that we are all part of a mechanism of proactive problem solving. And problem solving is a series of interactions that we have with ourselves, and we have with our healthcare provider and our healthcare provider has in their own brain or may go off and speak with other healthcare providers to get a better idea, um, but it's all, or send you for a referral, but this is all in the realm of this mechanism of problem solving. And we're each, all of us as important to each other so that the problem solving can happen well and can happen efficiently. Um, and these relate to communication strategies. Um, and um, in our article, we mostly focus on the clinician's um, um, corner of the problem. But in, in our talk today, we're really gonna focus on, on, on things from a patient's point of view. Um, so what do we need to be doing in terms of developing better communication strategies, understanding our symptoms, the level of symptom dis distress, recognizing what frightens us, recognizing what um, is impairing our ability to interface with the world around us, um, and understanding your team, understanding the clinician, um, and where they're coming from as well, so that you can get the best out of your exchanges with, with the clinician. Okay. So clinician patient interactions. And this is where this is this is where a great deal of the problem solving um, takes flight. Because, because it really begins, it germinates, it seeds with the patient and the patient's expertise of their own life. But it, it begins to take life um, in problem solving between the clinician and the patient. So firstly, we need to be able to identify the problem, be able to name it. Then what happens next in our interactions is that there's further investigation. The clinician may need to ask more questions. They may feel the necessity of obtaining more tests. But this is all in trying to crystallize and characterize what is really behind the symptom so that it can be better um, addressed and appropriately addressed for what it is. And then there's discussions of management, both the short-term management and the long-term management. So for somebody with active pulmonary um, sarcoidosis that has started having a terrible cough that we know isn't pneumonia, we've checked it out, it isn't pneumonia, um, but we feel certain that it's sarcoidosis um, um, being active, a short term might the short term answer might be a short course of steroids because that will be quick, but in the long term we might have to rethink our plans about because we don't want to leave somebody on prednisone ever if we can help it. But so we want to think about the future and so prednisone yes for this week, but how are we going to manage this in the most most healthful, most appropriate way in the long term. And then follow up. And that means the work that each the clinician and the patient is doing um, at home, uh, whether that's related to a referral, referral to another consult, uh, consultant, or referral to therapy, uh, uh, starting a med, starting a new med, and then, and then reassessment happens and uh, to see how far things have 
gone in terms of reducing the symptom distress or resolving it. So, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so this is um, the, 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 the one major thing that gets in the way of being able to have good communication, um, at least from the, the, the patient side of things, is um, feeling overwhelmed, not knowing where to begin, um, a very large burden and some symptom in our life, it starts to take on a it starts to take on a life of its own sometimes, like a big looming monster. And it starts to uh, cultivate emotions, impair and, and press us in ways psychologically. And it, it can make us frantic. It can make us panicked. And um, so we can feel overwhelmed by our symptoms. And when we feel overwhelmed, it makes it um, difficult to express ourselves like a deer in the headlights almost because it's hijacked, uh, the, the sense of being overwhelmed has sort of hijacked our mind. It's made us difficult, made, making it difficult to express ourselves. But it also makes it difficult to kind of hear what's being said, um, just like a deer in the headlights, it's the same thing. Um, and it makes it uh, more difficult to think. To, because in order to think, and in order to think well, we need to have a spaciousness of mind. And in order to have a spaciousness of mind, our levels of panic cannot be very high. We can still be panicked. You know, some of us, you know, tend to be edgy, but, but, but we need to cultivate an ability to have more um, breadth of thought and mind, um, to be able to recognize things and to be able to problem solve. So we're able to find the wood for the trees, to be able to um, calming the, the overwhelm. And the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research's um, video library has a whole section that is dedicated to practices of mindfulness. And when I say a whole section, I mean several videos, lots of videos, including Qigong practice, um, and, and these are the, these mindfulness applications help us, can help us to slow down our racing thoughts and to create more space in our mind and a more ease in our mind. So some of the things that can help deal with this monster that feels like it's everywhere is naming it for what it is, listing, listing, if it's more than one thing, listing those things listing the ways it bothers us um, and being able to describe it. Because when we can characterize things, when we can name them, they tend not to be so, they tend not to be so overwhelming. And then we have more of an opportunity to be able to manage the psychologically um, and they have less control over us. Um, and that's not diminishing the seriousness of the symptom, but that's just trying to find a way of remaining functional psychologically in the context of experiencing these symptoms. And so when we do these things, we're able to, um, we're able to then name them because we have to name them, list them, and we have to be able to describe them because that's part of communication, right? So we're able to communicate better about it. And then we're able to finally be able to get the help we need because we can articulate and we can convey what's going on and provide important decision-making information that the clinician needs. So, we name the sensations and the concerns that we have about them. I'm afraid this is what's going to kill me. Write it down. It's not it's nothing. There's nothing that's um, unintelligent. There's nothing that's stupid. There's nothing that you should feel ashamed about. Um, name the sensations. Name what the concerns are. Um, 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 if if you you're afraid that there's something that what you're going to die from, put it down there. Then when you go to visit with your, your clinician, they'll be able to tell you, 
free you from that, hopefully. Um, or I'm afraid that my, um, um, I, I'm not gonna be able to continue to work or I'm afraid I'm gonna lose the ability to use that leg. Uh, I'm afraid I won't ever be able to do uh, sums in my head, calculations in my head the way I used to with this brain fog. Nay, put it down there when it when we, when we when we put it, take it outside of ourselves, we can um, contain things, see them for what they are, and perhaps um, be able to better problem solve. So we slow down the mind with mindful activities, walking, sitting outdoors, letting the mind wander, and um, speaking our speaking our experiences out and our concerns out into friends, to support groups, or writing them out. And these mechanisms help us problem solve, help us get the information we need to get the help that we need. And I'm just gonna put a plug in for this book. And it's actually a movement, not such a book, but it's been a, it's been a big kind of Fortune 500 um, uh, intervention. So not, not necessarily initially for healthcare, but this has really kind of trickled down into um, uh, skills, skills development for chronic illness. And it's creating time to think. And, and um, this is, um, it's, it's the um, thinking project and the thinking project creates a thinking environment. And we, and Nancy Klein was the uh, was the founder, the pioneer behind these um, concepts. And basically it's to be able to unrestrictedly name these things, say these things, because you believe that you're going to get to the, um, to the answer. And oftentimes this is in support with another um, person helping you and, and so that you're there um, speaking or writing. Now you don't have to get the book. You can, in fact, um, just look it up and there's a nice article in the Guardian newspaper uh, from a few years ago that kind of encapsulates it. And there's also loads of uh, videos, but, but these um, mechanisms really help us to articulate um, and get and become uh, more robust problem solvers. Okay, so stating the problem, this is an algorithm here. We state the problem, problems, and for each of those problems or concerns, we state the level of intensity of, with, with the, the, that it's interfering with our lives. We articulate and we just, we, we share what we've learned about what we noticed about these symptoms. Um, and we are engaged. We, we are engaged in our healthcare, knowing our medications, addressing the plan of the previous times that we've had um, visits with our pro uh, pro provider. So, so, but then we have to think, sometimes we think about our communication and when it went right and when it wasn't so helpful and what was getting in the way. What was get, and, the, and this happens to everybody, and this happens to uh, clinicians, you know. And we are trying to understand unconscious bias, and these are and what are the influences that um, um, impair our ability to communicate well with everybody? Well, sometimes we may be in the middle of a communication or interaction, or we haven't even begun an interaction, but we come with. We come with our bad experiences from the past and this the past experiences of maybe having been dismissed or disrespected or not listened to. And we, we, can, we sometimes carry that anger, frustration or deep sadness and hopelessness maybe into our future encounters. And so these are important to recognize when we're doing that and it takes time because this is like a tip of an iceberg type of um, adventure here that I'm talking about. Um, sometimes we may get into, um, make it into an interaction with a, a healthcare provider and we're really just unloading our frustration and almost in a blameful way. 
Um, and it might feel good at the time, but when we leave, we notice that we, it hasn't really helped us. It hasn't furthered the situation any um, uh, by getting into that mechanism. Um, and we may experience or be kind of reacting to our our own displeasure with ourselves, but it's coming out the wrong way in terms of um, that we weren't we we didn't really do our work on ourselves like our health organization um, and uh, communicated adequately, etc. And there's and I'll say at this point there's nothing better than being honest about um, um, about where you're coming from um, or you know I didn't. I didn't take my medications because um, I didn't. So these are things that that level the ground in a communication setting. Um, and so it stops being a reactive communication. Um, I hope that was helpful. And then the other thing that can interfere with our actions, our healthcare actions and our healthcare communications is feeling down, feeling depressed, and that can impede um, a sense of hopelessness can impede our ability to be proactive in terms of communication, in terms of um, making an effort to adhere with the things that we decided to do in the last visit with the healthcare provider. So we practice recognizing where our voice and where our actions are coming from. And we try to decipher whether, whether this is helpful to getting what we need and what we want or not so helpful. And if it's not so helpful, we, it's okay. It's happening, but we notice it and then we redirect. So when you get onto the FSR library, and I even think I have one of my uh, mindfulness ones there and we, there's another wonderful um, person that does a lot of the FSR mindfulness, um, you learn about redirecting and you're, you notice about kindness to yourself Notice that something, your mind has gone off or you've gone off track and gently, kindly invite yourself back to redirect and then engage in what's helpful. Okay, boop. So, um, uh, my, my um, screen has gone blank. Okay. We still see your screen. I mean, we Yay, it's, it's back, it's back. Oh God, do you, do you have my um, screen? Screen sharing oh. has stopped as the window has closed. Okay, no problem. <laughs> um, I, can, I can do that. Um, Let me know if you want me to bring the slides up. On my okay, you, okay, that would, um, let me see. Files. Well, we might need to, I'm not sure what happened now. Um, yeah. Let's see, you were on, I think slide 20. Could be. <laughs> on I'll share it and then you tell me if that's right. Yeah, okay, that sounds good. Is this the one? Uh, yes, and then we can. Share okay. from there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, You'll have to let me know when to push the button. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering if you can sh give me a remote control. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I can control Mindy's screen. Fantastic. <laughs> I like that. Uh, right. Okay. There you go. Okay. It. Hmm. Mindy, it's a little bit slow. Yeah, there's probably a delay. There's I'm almost a delay. You to take, I'm going to ask you to take over if you don't mind uh, okay. and, and, and release me from being the controller so that folks can have a pleasurable 
non-frustrating experience. There you go. So I've removed it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, so we can move forward. No one hit. Yeah. Please next. And so, so ultimately, we want to be heard, and we want a solution um, to our problems. Um, and we we often we often look towards this person. Thank you, Mindy. And <laughs> and but one thing it's really important to remember is that um, thank you. That's good. Um, that 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 the clinician, the healthcare provider, though it's easy to kind of slip into thinking that, you know, healthcare providers uh, have crystal balls or ha can wave magic wands. Um, we need help. And we're often people who are just like everybody else. We may have, um, we may ourselves have a chronic illness. We may be caring for a loved one with dementia. We may be uh, having really difficult times with our teenager, or um, we, we may be caring, we may have had a recent loss. So um, one, one um, patient that I care for a great deal and longtime patient of mine, um, he was, he was shocked when his cardiologist had died of uh, heart trouble. And it's, he said it jolted him because it jolted him into how he thought about his healthcare providers and that really they're a lot like everybody else. So, and it's good to remember what, um, that healthcare providers work under extreme time pressure. So every little bit that you can do in terms of using time wisely and engaging in um, uh, some of the strategies that we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about today um, can, can really help. Um, next, please. So, and the workload, not just the time pressures, like within the hours of uh, usual working hours, but the, the workload is very heavy. And for one visit, uh, many people don't realize that healthcare providers um, are preparing for the next day of seeing patients. So you may prepare to see for each, for each patient an, an additional half an hour, even sometimes an hour. And then after the patient's gone, the work that has to be done related to that one single visit can be you know, anywhere from uh, half an hour to three hours. And so where does that come from? You know, that comes from, oh, um, so Eddie, that, that comes from outside clinic hours and, so the more one can be a proactive um, uh, partner in terms of problem solving and helping to provide what's needed um, so that the healthcare provider who's under a great deal of stress can help, the, can help them do their job better. And ev most healthcare providers wanna do a great job. Um, and so um, next please. So, and, and, and further, yes, the workload pressures, but also we're, when we go from room to room seeing patients, you know, we may have just given somebody really terrible news or told them it's time to transition to hospice or, um, or, or having to navigate a, a lung transplant with somebody in the, in the room before. And though we try never to, we try always to separate our patients um, uh, and, and not to compare the importance of one, one experience to the next. Remember, they're human. So again, so if, if, if a patient comes and, and provides information that they've thought about in a more clear, more succinct way, it can, help that healthcare provider shift into a better focus, an easier focus on what you're, or we are there for today. Next, please. So, and then the other issue is, is that 
pain and fatigue symptoms and symptoms of that nature tend to require much more time and thought to get to the right answer rather than somebody uh, coming in with leg uh, leg swelling and and a uh, uh, and um, some heart sounds, which I can help them straight away. Um, I know what this is, even though it, 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 in my mind as a clinician, it may be more severe. But, um, but so, so we're trying to create a thinking environment for, for the clinician in order to get the best out of them. Next, please. So we're gonna go ahead and look at some approaches and next. So after everything that I've just said, that doesn't ever mean anybody should be treated disrespectfully. We're talking about the pressures of the healthcare person. Um, one should never be disrespected. One should never have any problem dismissed. And one, and this is a an, uh, a partnership where people bring different different qualities and problem solving skills to the table, and. Um, it's not a position where somebody has to beseech or beg or kowtow. We are partners. Um, and so expectations should um, always be, to be treated respectfully and, and not have your concerns dismissed. Next. Experience that your clinician will have direct communication with other clinicians that are caring for you next and have the expectation of reasonable solutions, short-term uh, uh, solutions, long-term solutions, um, in further investigations. Not that all of these could necessarily be addressed, but they could be um, discussed. And nobody dictates care. As a healthcare provider, I should never be telling somebody what to do without inviting their concerns about the plan, whether that's testing or treatment. And, and likewise, um, as a patient, if I'm walking into um, a treatment room to speak with a, a doctor and um, expecting certain things to happen um, without their input, and that, that's also problematic. Reasonable solutions are referrals and also second opinions matter. So if you feel that um, a second opinion is worthwhile, that is an expectation that your healthcare provider should provide to you um, and the ability to do such. Next, please. Um, and clear explanations, clearly discussing investigations and treatments. Next, please. Okay, so we identify the problem. Next, please. We state intensity of the interference in our life. Next, please. Articulate the qualities, the, the factors. Next, please. And be engaged and be a, pro, a proactive partner um, when we're patients. Next, please. So identifying the problem. Next, please. So do this work ahead of time. Next, identify each major concern ahead of time. Next, list and rank these issues and list them and rank them according to what seems most urgent to you for whatever reason that is. What, whatever reason it's most urgent for you. Next, please. Or what you're most afraid of. Those are, those are the important qualities next, please. And spend time with yourself, with somebody else, learning how to describe them next, please. So stating the intensity of interference is important next. Avoid trying to convince somebody of how much this is bothering you. Next, please. It's not worth your energy and it's not worth your time. And it saves time for problem-based solutions. Next, please. The simple fact that you said it's distressing you should be enough to any healthcare provider without you having to convince them. 
um, you can use a scale. Something that's really helpful is using a scale of zero to 10 next to directly state the level of next, distress next, or state the level of zero to 10. On a scale of zero to 10, it's interfering with it like a seven in my life or interfering with, like my, with inability to work um, at a five. Who can work at half mast, not met and, and, and get by and keep a job, right? So um, using a scale of zero to 10, being able to simply state on a scale of zero to 10, this, this pain is causing me a level of seven distress. That's love and self distress level, something to that manner. Um, and that makes it simple. Then you can move forward. Um, next, you can also provide an example or two to help illustrate um, if, if the healthcare provider seems perplexed. Next. Again, think about this, do this work ahead of time. Next. And do it for each major concern. Next, please. So articulate, we're gonna talk a lot more about this in a minute. And again, this is about stepping back and seeing symptoms from outside of oneself without all the heaviness of it being this impending doom and monster. Next, please. Take an inventory of what one sees from this more detached or outside view in terms of pattern, location, quality, et cetera. Next, please. And it helps to describe our physical symptoms clearly for ourselves and convey them clearly to our healthcare provider next. It may be uncomfortable, that's for sure. We don't like, we don't, we don't like to complain. We don't like to moan. We would love to just, like a car, take ourselves into the shop and just get it fixed without owning any of this. But unfortunately, next. Um, next we we need to this is a process of getting to a solution and we have to be part of that solution and it doesn't mean we own those symptoms but we have an expertise in those symptoms that we're experiencing next so again do this work ahead of time next and for each major concern next more to come on this so Again, we state the problem, state the level of intensity of the interference. And next, oh yeah, keep going. We articulate, next. And we are engaged, next. And being engaged, this requires, this requires work. This is the work, um, remember how I mentioned that there's a lot of time dedicated by a healthcare provider before a patient even visits and a lot of time and work that goes into after. And, and so what we're doing is we're creating a working partnership. And so being engaged, knowing your medications next, um, being able to address the previous plan, have notes that you've made with these discussions with yourself, um, figuring things out, bring those notes with you because they could help you. Take notes during the visit and demonstrate a true partnership by, next please, know, know the medications you're taking, know them well, know how to say them. You can, each time you take a medication, if you have trouble saying it, read the bottle at the same time and say it. Um, that knowing your medications can actually save your life. Um, be prepared to discuss the previous plan from the last visit. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into seeing a patient. And um, if you're not happy at the time with the plan, try to find words to explain it. But when you come to the next visit, be able to describe how you engaged with either getting into therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, trying the new medication, Next, please. And explain any challenges that you may have had with adherence, like perhaps um, I tried on the first day, I tried again on the second day, I tried again on the third day, but taking medicine X, I ended up throwing up. 
Um, you could also reach out to the physician if something like that happens, and then something may be done in the in, in intern visit so that time isn't lost. But being able to being able to concretely discuss the last plan and any difficulties meeting the plan is demonstrates that you you're really here to work with the healthcare provider. Next, please. Again, do this work ahead of time. And again, next, I'm gonna turn this light on to see if it helps. Woo. Okay, hopefully that helps a little bit. Um, okay, next, please. Okay, so I was going to dedicate a whole, um, talk to this, but it became clear in discussing with Mindy that our, our, the community felt an urgency to kind of focus on pain. So we're going to, this is some red flags and they're not every, remember, uh, and we're going to talk about medication related uh, red flag symptoms maybe another time. But Mindy, can you hit the button? Um, so any constitutional sudden fever, onset of fever, chills, or cough uh, is a major concern that you want to seek immediate care for next. Sudden onset of shortness of breath or cough, very important. Again, could be pneumonia, could also be a blood clot, um, or it could, um, it, it could be um, heart related. Next, please. Any pain, pressure, or visual disturbances, um, those require seeking immediate help. Next, uh, facial lesions that um, seem to be growing in size. Um, they're distressing, um, but, they, but we think that also that they could be reflective of sarcoidosis in other uh, areas as well. And though it may not be a, um, an emergent situation, it's something that you should try to get in to see a physician for so that earlier treatment um, can be initiated. Next, please, nervous system. There's a number of, of issues here, um, but these are, the, these are some main ones. If you're having more falls, if you're having an, a single abnormal fall in, an, in a familiar place, that's worrisome. If you're having persistent headache, if you're experiencing weakness in a limb, your arm, a leg, et cetera, you're having difficulty moving it even slightly. And sarcoidosis tends to be slow and indolent, um, but, but at the same time, if these are issues that are happening, um, seek help immediately. Uh, persistent loss of sensation um, or, or, or acute onset of pain in anywhere, a limb, face, um, and incontinence. If you are having trouble holding urine or feces, this is important. This could be a neurologic issue that deserves immediate attention. Next, please. If you're finding uncharacteristically that you're having heart racing, heart pounding, um, swollen legs, uh, you feel like fainting, um, uh, experiencing dizziness or, or rapid increase of shortness of breath, um, Difficulty lying flat because you become short of breath or in the middle of the night, you wake up gasping for air. These are all important concerns that, that require immediate access to care. Next, acute or persistent localized pain. That can be a fracture um, or it can be what's called avascular necrosis, which is when, when the bone, a part of the bone, and this happens a lot in steroid use, is starved of oxygen. And unfortunately, patients that have been on prednisone for a long period of time, this is something tragically, tragically common. Um, and um, so please be aware, seek immediate help. The sooner there's treatment uh, for either of these, the more likely um, it, it can be resolved. In a, in a fruitful way. Next, please. Cognition, depression, anxiety, very quickly. Important to say, next. These are real experiences. They are real. Um, and we may experience them maybe before sarcoidosis, we had these issues, but maybe it could be related to the condition itself, or maybe it could be situational because of all of the hardship that having this condition brings. Next. Um, de depression, 
when it's present, it, it can worsen uh, fatigue and it can get worse because of fatigue next. And it's and the same with brain fog or cognitive dysfunction and ability to focus next. And this is a vicious cycle. These all feed into each other. And so um, paying attention to fatigue, learning as much about fatigue and fatigue management. Um, if you think you're depressed, um, seek help, even for a short period of time. Even being on antidepressants for six months can really, and then weaning off of them, can really help manage a situation. Next, please. And remember that um, um, depression is never an excuse a healthcare provider should assign to your symptoms, any of your symptoms, which are real and are not actually depression. For example, next, pain or fatigue. So being depressed or experiencing depression or anyone ever saying your pain or your fatigue or your X, Y, or Z is because you're depressed um, is not acceptable and it's not appropriate. Next. Okay, whole video online, FSR, video library, ever expanding resource. Please check out this um, video on fatigue um, and understanding fatigue management and its causes. And, and again, we, we discussed in that video, it could be related to inflammation, physical deconditioning, very common. And, and even if it's not related to physical deconditioning, exercise can make fatigue better, reduce fatigue, sleep quality, cornerstone of everything, um, decreased oxygenation because of anemia, heart, lung, hormonal issues, diabetes, diabetes related to steroid, thyroid issues, testosterone issues, steroid withdrawal issues, medications, physical impairment, psychological stress, all of these things can contribute to fatigue and pacing. Pacing um, is an important adjunct to other treatment in dealing with fatigue. Next, please. Pain, okay, here we go, sister, hit it. Fatigues the body, next. Taxes the mind and the brain. Fatigue can really tax our brain, emotions, next. And it's important to know where the pain is coming from in order to be able to treat the pain appropriately. Different pain requires different treatment. And most of the time, opioids are not the right answer. Not the right answer. Um, but there's, um, but knowing where this pain is coming from can make a, a, an incredible difference to um, quality of life and living with decreased pain or pain-free. Next. So we le learn how to describe the different pains to help um, clinicians. Next. It can, is it a pain related to inflammation? Next. Related to nerves? Next. Is it related to muscle tension, which happens a lot when we are under biological stress or emotional stress? We get muscle tension that can be absolutely disabling as our body tries to hold us together um, and keep us moving forward. Our muscles tense and then they ratchet up and they're painful. It's something that happens secondarily to a number of, of um, especially inflammatory health conditions. Um, and it worsens with poor sleep, and, it, and this, this syndrome worsens with inactivity next. So again, just as with fatigue, we consider pacing next. So old carts, I know this sounds so silly, but this is to help us when we're writing out our history and when we're trying to understand our pain history. Um, and in medical school, we, we, and it became such a habit making these mnemonics, like we made mnemonics to remember the street where we lived, we got into the habit of it. So it's not next, please. So old carts, what it stands for. Oh, onset, when did your pain start? Next, location, where does it hurt? Next, duration, how long does your pain last when it occurs? Next, and the characters and the quality of it. How does your pain feel? Is it aching? Is it burning, shooting, tingling, throbbing, sharp, burning? Is it intermittent? Is it all the time? Next. Um, A, alleviating, aggravating, and, and, and uh, what makes it better? What makes it worse? Does 
uh, we'll talk about that more. Attribution, what do, do, what do you think causes it? Because sometimes the patient has the answer already and that can really help a lot. Like, um, well, um, things that a physician may not be able to clue into. Well, actually, um, I, I fell or I was pulling out a, a plant from the ground and I felt something go in my shoulder. So what do you think it is? Um, next are radiation. Does the pain travel anywhere else? Next, timing patterns, temporality. Um, does your pain vary over the day? Is it intermittent? And what time of the day is it more frequent? Next. Um, and are there symptoms associated with, with anything else? Does, uh, does your um, pain impact your physical function, um, your mood or your sleep? Next, please. So pain location. Um, uh, so this is the L in old carts. And so body maps can help us. You can find body maps online, print them, print the one that you think is helpful to you or, or fill out different ones. Um, like here we have two, two different types. One is kind of more um, uh, definitive and the other one is, kind of, is more freestyle for a patient. And this can help perhaps get you to pinpoint when it, um, where your pain is. Again, taking it outside of ourselves um, can help us see things clearly next, please. So pain quality, it tells us an awful lot next. Um, you can go through these really quickly, Mindy. Sharp, throbbing, achy, stiffness. Is it tender to touch? Um, is it electric? Is it shooting? Is it burning? Is it tingling? Is it... Is there numbness associated with it next? And that can, that can tell us if this is more inflammatory type of pain, if it, or if there's inflammation that's causing compression of a nerve, or um, or if there it could be infected. Um, whether it's muscle tension, muscle inflammation, it can tell us about nerve impingement. Um, um, and, and explaining qualities can tell us uh, more about the quality of the nerve involvement. Is it a sensory neuropathy perchance? Next, Mindy. So um, the A's of old card, alleviating, hit the next one, Mindy, uh, alleviating, aggravating um, possible attributions. Do you, do, do you think anything makes it better? Next, uh, running your hands under warm water, does that help next? Moving around, does that help ease it? Raising an arm above one's head sometimes uh, can help if you have a nerve entrapment somewhere next. Sitting up, if you're having a certain type of uh, uh, reason for having chest pain, um, next. Um, taking an acetaminophen, does that make it better? Next. Resting, does that make it better? Next. Does anything make it worse? Next. Lying down just makes it so much worse. Um, bright light, um, for example, if you're having eye pain or headache, that can help help a physician decipher and problem solve what type of headache you could have or the, or the reason you're having eye pain. Does it hurt to take a deep breath in? Does that make your pain worse? Next. Any idea what caused it next? Falling next, coughing next. Uh, was it after a hospitalization maybe that you started having pain going down your leg because you were in bed for a long time next? Any treatment that you tried already, this is really important part of it. Any medications you've tried either by yourself or with another clinician, uh, had you tried therapy for it? All of these things are important to the problem solving next. And the timing, the the T in old carts, timing, temporality, patterns related to pain. Next, he just go through them in the time of day. Was it in the night waking you up in the middle of the night? Does it get better with sleep or rest? Does it come and go? Does it ease on as the day um, moves forward? Um, is it worse at the end of the day? Oh, does it happen after eating? Or do you feel it before eating? Um, this could be important to, to help decipher what type of ulcer you might have if you have pain in abdominal pain, for example, or um, 
or gallbladder pain or so um or is that happening after you're sitting a long time these timing issues tell us a great deal next mindy old cards so let's go through a couple mindy just put all of these on the yeah so and we're going to leave them up here as we go through a couple of um as we go through a couple of scenarios so um and remember the old carts we just made a word this doesn't have to happen in a certain order it doesn't have so you don't have to go through it in a certain order you can go through it or talk about it it in terms of what part of it is most important or relevant to you it's just a mnemonic to help us remember the different parts so let's go through the first scenario um when did your when did your pain start my pain started about um maybe three months ago it's my hands it's the small joints of my hands um when i open and close them i can feel it um and it feels achy and stiff across here across here um well the pain lasts all day long but i know that if i start to move the stiffness eases up and the pain eases up but it's there really all day long um and it's sometimes throbbing a lot of the time aching um what makes it better if i run my hands under water that helps to make it better um sometimes taking an aleve i know i'm not supposed to be taking those but i find that it makes it feel better um and what do you think it is? I don't know. I don't know what this is, but it's interfering with everything. Um, and does it radiate anywhere? No, but sometimes my arms get achy too. Um, sometimes my elbows, um, the timing pattern. Well, it's more pronounced in the morning. Um, well, it does it impact? Yes, it impacts my sleep because I start to notice the stiffness when I'm sleeping. So this is an inflammatory type of pain. This is talking about, this is what somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or sarcoid related inflammatory arthritis might experience. Sarcoid uh, inflammatory arthritis also tends to happen a lot in the feet, less, less so in the hands, more in the feet and the ankles. So you might have similar experiences in your feet, ankles, and knees. Don't understand why it's more prominent in the lower extremities. Um, so next, um, oh, oh, I mean, sorry, not you next, Mindy. <laughs> next in the examples. Um, so I have, I, I have a, I have this pain in my chest. Um, it's it's right here. It started about a week ago, and um, it's just there all the time. It's in, in, in it feels like sometimes it's getting better and sometimes it's getting worse, but it's always there. It's sharp and it's sometimes throbbing and there's not too much that I can do that makes it better. And um, touching it hurts a lot. Taking a deep breath in, it hurts a lot to do that. Um, and I've tried, I've tried taking um, a leave. I've tried taking acetaminophen, um, um, not taking a deep breath in makes the pain less, but it's still there. And um, it's disturbing my sleep. It's making me grumpy. Um, when, um, um, well, I think, I think like I've been coughing an awful lot and I had been coughing and it hurts like the heck when I cough. And, and, and I, I know that this happened soon after I had this really bad episode of coughing. So what am I describing? Possibly a cracked rib related to coughing. Um, what other things? Um, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to pick and choose. <laughs> okay, so let's take another scenario. Oh, my arm, my whole arm, it just, it really just hurts. And um, the pain, this happened before, it didn't last so long. And now it's like, it's been happening, going on for the last week. Um, it's, it's like the whole arm, it feels like it's, it feels like it starts up in the elbow. And then I can, it feels it moves down to my hand. And, um, 
I've, I've not been able to do anything that makes it better. Sometimes when I'm sleeping, if I put it above my head, it might help. Or um, sometimes just holding my arm above my head can, can make it less and I can move my hand a bit better. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so what I'm describing, the pain is shooting. It's, um, it's burning sometimes and sometimes it feels electric. So what I'm trying to convey is that I'm describing somebody who might have an entrapped nerve um, in the, the ulnar part of the arm. So there's so much that we can provide. Somebody, for example, who has um, maybe the avascular necrosis where they had um, oxygen starvation of the bone. Um, it's a dull throbbing. It's there all the time. It hurts when I put weight on it. It hurts to touch it if I touch it deep enough. Um, um, it kind of radiates down the leg. Um, and um, I feel it less so when I'm lying down, but when I turn on my side when I'm sleeping, it hurts. So I'm hoping that this is giving you some idea of how we can really help our um, healthcare providers zero in on all of on any of the various entities that could be causing pain in order to get effective treatment. Next, please. Breathlessness is our next. Um, breathlessness is a, a another another monster in the room. It impacts us physically, psychologically, emotionally, cognitively. Next, please. Um, um, there's many causes. Next, keep. Um, go all the way down to the end. It could be the heart, lung, because of lung fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension or infection. Breathlessness can occur with anxiety or we can have breathing pattern disorders where um, we our breath um, sometimes dissociates from our body. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It can happen most frequently because we're physically deconditioned and that adds to a lot of chronic health conditions because people get deconditioned over time. Muscle fatigue, muscle involvement, anemia, and uh, very, very importantly, again, do not ever not think about the typical causes in, the, in a general population, especially those of an urgent nature. Mindy next which is things like coronary artery disease that can give us a heart attack or, or, uh, or a stroke. Um, um, COPD, emphysema, and the uh, long-term effects of sleep apnea. Next, please, Mindy. Um, so, and again, just like with fatigue, we wanna pace ourselves next. So dysfunctional breathing pattern, it's really important to talk about because it's an emerging field and it's been accelerated since COVID and long COVID came about. Really fantastic work that's being done. It's what's on top of the breathing problem we already have that's making that breathing problem perhaps seem worse and our breathing patterns not help us in making, making things dysfunctional. Next, please. Um, so there, there are patterns of breathing. It could be rapid, shallow breathing, like hyperventilating, next. It could be breath holding, next. It could be um, a sensation of our breath is going at its own place where our mind is somewhere else. Um, and that's what happens when we get panicked, right? Deer in the headlight, next. Um, and um, we often feel disconnected um, when we're experiencing breath pattern disorders, next. And it, it's, it's higher in people that have cardiopulmonary difficulties. Why? Because when we have a cardiopulmonary difficulty, we're already worried about our breathing and we're worried about the effects of our breathing. So that kind of impounds um, our, uh, and, and confounds the relationship we have with our breathing. Next. So, um, so with breathing, there's a lot of neurophysiologic um, a psychological, emotional overlays with these breathlessness sensations. And when we, when we have these breathing pattern disorders, we also, it's not just the fact that we're breathing faster breath holding because our breath is a direct modulator of hormones that are released and um, how at ease we feel because we're using our uh, parts of our autonomic pathway in the, the, and how measured or not our breathing is. And we're emitting neurotransmitters 
Um, next, please. So many, many people experience breathing pattern disorders, not just people with cardiopulmonary problems. Next, please. But, um, but these can be caused by uh, anxiety root, that are rooted in memories or events of the past. Or next, please, how we see ourselves. But these patterns worsen with anxiety. Next. Next, please. So. Uh, Keep going all the way down, hun. Thank you. So important, important ways of mo modifying um, our breathing patterns and helping to regulate them and have more steady breathing patterns that we feel comfortable with in our body. Things like exercise, because it's rhythmic, it helps us to become um, more, uh, more at ease with our breathing and ride on our breath a bit more. And singing helps those, that, doing things like Tai Chi, um, these help regulate breathing and it helps to habituate. It help, remember, it's practice. We're always practicing. We're being kind to ourselves and we're practicing. And in this case, we're practicing things that help to create a more reliable breathing pattern that can sustain us, sustain our thinking, sustain our actions um, and our reactions. And when we sing and exercise, um, this helps to strengthen the largest muscle in our, one of the largest muscles in our body, if not the largest muscle in our body, which is the diaphragm. And, um, and it fortifies the positive sensations and connections of breath and body. Next, please. So uh, cough, it's again, very complex, very distressing, embarrassing, socially stigmatizing. Um, when we cough, everybody looks at us. We know that right? We feel it. Um, it's embarrassing. Um, many patients have problems with holding urine when they cough. This is a really important sy symptom, and it's important to pay attention to. Next, please. So in, in sarcoidosis with the lung, at active sarcoidosis, we could have a dry and inspiratory cough. We take a deep breath in, or when we talk, it aggravates us, and the cough leads to not just coughing, but a sensation of breathlessness that we can't catch our breath after we cough. So, so coughing becomes something very fearful. Um, because sometimes some people are afraid that they're going to die from coughing because it feels that way. Um, and things that aggravate cough are a post nasal drip and reflux. Very important to control these because the drip drips down and irritates the lungs. Um, these things, even in a person that doesn't have sarcoid can cause coughing. Uh, coughing in the throat, but when, when these substances get in the lung, they're irritants and they make our coughing worse and they make our lung disease worse. Um, pneumonia is another uh, cause of cough, um, subclinical lung infections, pneumonia, bronchiectasis. Next, please. Heart failure can be associated with cough as well. Next, please. Um, next. Um, so the quickest way, we talked about this before in an example, is to, if you have active sarcoid, um, immunosuppression can, can put a blanket on that cough, help to put a blanket on that cough. Um, next, please. Um, uh, and the, the most common immunosuppressant that, and one that acts the most quickly is prednisone. And hopefully we'll find a, a, a steroid alternative that's quick in onset but unfortunately we have none at the moment. Um, nose breathing as opposed to mouth breathing. Um, nose helps to warm the air. The nose has hair which filters particles. Particles can be a, a, a trigger. And so it warms the air and it, um, and, and it filters the air. Um, and colds can, can cause, it uh, can be a trigger to cough. Um, when our mouth is closed, Swallowing can help. Sucking on candies can help. Keeping our mouth and our throat moist, um, that can help keep um, the air that our lungs experience is moister. Um, and avoiding triggers like end particles, any smoke, scents, reflux, I talked about post nasal drip and cold air. And if you're out in the cold, as some of us are right now, you know, if you have a scarf, you can inch it up over your nose uh, and mouth or just even over your mouth, but it, it can be a layer to help warm the air that you're breathing in. Next, please. 
So I want to focus on physical activity and, and physical fitness because um, this plays a role in lots of symptoms and improving lots of symptoms. I'm not saying it's the end all or be all, but it's very important from gastrointestinal to um, psychological to, um, to pain. And um, next, please, so increased muscle mass. The more we have increased muscle mass, the more we have mass to contract. When we contract muscle, muscle floods the bloodstream with myriads of biochemicals that we know, this is it folks, we know that contracting muscle decreases inflammation through hundreds of pathways probably next. Um, increases circulation, which means increasing blood vessel repair, um, which ends up reconditioning nerves and helps maybe with nerve plasticity. In fact, exercise and physical activity and chemotherapy induced nerve damage um, is the only thing that has been consistently shown to improve um, nerve problems related to chemotherapy um, and relieves pain. Next, please. And it um, sends a signal to our brain um, in all sorts of ways, chemical and neurohormonal, relieves depression, anxiety. Next, improves cognition, focus, alertness, work productivity. Next, improved sleep quality and sleep is pivotal to everything, to inflammation and everything. So here is just a quick snapshot of um, the, the muscle, the, the research that's being done is exponential now. And this is the past five years of research. And honestly, this is, this it, we're, we're, we're on the throes of the decade of the muscle. The muscle as an organ that, that relates to the brain, the gut, uh, your bones, um, and, and all of these organs are dependent on muscle contraction to a good degree. And this is what we're learning. It's astounding. Next, please. So next. So, so in terms of our lungs, so how important is exercise? Well, the more we exercise, the more it impacts our body posture next. Just keep going, Mindy. So that means it helps to open the thorax, the shape of our thorax. Um, it softens and strengthens muscles of the back of the abdomen. Um, and that that's important for movement and strength. It, it helps keep us motivated by keeping our vision outside of ourselves when we move, we see the world around us. This is hard and fast evidence in psychology. Um, the lungs are better when body health, the very same lungs with the very same breathing uh, uh, tests and the very same looking CT scan of the chest pattern. Those lungs that um, have a, are in a body that moves are, are going to be much more ef efficient, um, and um, the body's going to have better alignment, safer alignment, I should say. And when we move, we lubricate the joints, um, and we so we get to soften but strengthen those joints, um, and. Of course, when we move, neurovascular networks are laid down. And again, we learn to regulate. We learn to develop a regulation of breath that we can depend on over time. Next, Next please. Thank you. So what if I'm exhausted, I'm incapacitated, or if I'm experiencing a flare? Next, Mindy, next, next, next. Small movements go a long way. Every little movement we do is healthful. Small movements also contract muscles locally, and they can also have systemic effects. Um, and there are many of regimens that can be done in the bed for special situations. And if you're, for example, having a ter terrible neuro um, sarcoid flare, for example, and you just can't get yourself out of the bed, just even, even flexing your feet and relaxing and flexing again or squeezing your bottom in bed and relaxing can, um, is exercise and that can help, um, help provide you with ease and strength. Next. Next. Humming, singing is another low-key exercise that can be done um, because, again, we're using that 
big old muscle, the diaphragm. Um, and you can hum and sing and breathe to yourself, noticing the different vibrations, um, using song or humming as a way to physically or mentally um, carry one through your tasks of the day. Um, the more we sing, the more we hum, and there's more and more and more and more work being done, especially in England, about singing, and especially spurred on by long COVID, that we're learning that singing can really um, impact us in so many ways. Um, and it is, again, it's a self-regulation tool, um, can help us develop less fatiguing breath patterns. Um, we get the big muscle contraction benefits from the diaphragm because it's a big fat muscle. And, um, and we can use vibration and vibration may, vibration itself may have its own benefits independent of the benefits we're finding, we're getting from muscle. So many gentle soothing um, movements that we can be done that are, that can be done that are strengthening and um, actually helping us move to better alignment like Tai Chi, like um, Nidra Yoga, like just listening to the pressure that breath is creating in your body, dancing, mindful movement, um, uh, Feldenkrais, Laban, anything that cultivates a, a sense of well-being and a cool spaciousness in the body and mind. And again, go to the FSR website, the, the video, um, the video uh, library, your inner guru, you listen to your inner guru and nothing that you undertake should be, um, we should never take a disappointing eye to ourself. We, it's all for the learning. And if you notice that you're getting frustrated with yourself or disappointed, or you don't like the way you look, just again, to use that as a mindfulness exercise, notice that you're having those unpleasant thoughts about yourself and turn it around and um, come back to habituate to self-kindness. Next, please. So who can exercise? Next, please. Anybody with without pulmonary involvement, um, anybody without any recent physical trauma or red flags um, or can exercise without restriction. People with cardiopulmonary involvement, yes, hands down. We know these people benefit. Um, it's, it's feasible, it's safe, um, and it's re regardless of the underlying diagnosis, whether it's pulmonary fibrosis, ILD, or pulmonary hypertension, um, or, or even heart failure, um, we know that if we can do, if we, if we teach patients how to self-pace, we can, we can engage in self-exercise, uh, safe exercise. So patients with moderate disease, um, cardiopulmonary disease, they should go undergo screening with all that you see on the screen. Patients with mild um, pulmonary involvement, it's safe for folks to begin to exercise and exercise in a moderate way, which breaks a gentle sweat. Um, so, and then patients with um, uh, muscle involvement or um, joint involvement or cardiopulmonary involvement, they may need a little bit of extra help. And again, once again, supervised um, learning how to exercise. Next, please. Breathlessness is an exercise. Thank you, Mindy. Keep going. Um, Cardiopulmonary related breathlessness is not the same as other people's breathlessness. A person that doesn't have a health condition that runs up a hill and is short of breath and can't catch their breath is a very different experience than somebody that has an underlying health condition and they're experiencing breathlessness. Why? Because our if we have a cardiopulmonary condition, our breathlessness is tied to a lot of emotion, a lot of fear, a lot of concern, and um, it interferes with all of our choices and um, and what we're thinking at any one time. If I'm somebody without a health condition, I run up the hill, I know my breath is going to come back. Is it an unpleasant feeling? Yes, but I know my breath is going to come back. Whereas if I'm somebody that's living with a cardiopulmonary condition, um, those thoughts can be tremendous and impending and really weigh us down psychologically and hurt. Um, so um, breathlessness, so, so these things can, so these concepts, these heavy, heavy concepts can hinder us from engaging in what's good for us, which is um, healthful movement, healthful exercise um, in breath and, and understanding that there's a difference between breathlessness and decreasing oxygen saturation. They are two different things. You can be breathless 
and not have decreased oxygen saturation. Breathlessness can be related to anxiety and it could be related to physical deconditioning. Um, so low oxygen is a chemical phenomena. Um, and um, breathlessness is a complex, again, multi-layered experience. And, but in and of itself, breathless without desaturation is not harm, harmful. And being physically unfit is harmful and harms us in lots of ways. Um, um, but being physically unfit causes breathlessness and fatigue as some of the ways that it harms us. Um, so being fit makes us more breathless and makes us more fatigued. And exercise um, treats physical fitness as well as treating many other symptoms from GI to, to, to CNS to neurologic, et cetera. But exercise causes breathlessness. And it's important to recognize that this happens and it's an okay thing if it's a safe thing. Um, and it can be done, exercise can be done in a non-distressing manner. We spoke a lot about that. And on the FSR video library, you can tune into some of those um, videos. Um, but exercise will help us diminish breathlessness over time because ethnic, because um, breathlessness treats uh, physical deconditioning. Right, and physical deconditioning contributes to breathlessness and fatigue. So exercise uh, diminishes those things over time. Next, please, Mindy. Um, I think we can skip this one. It's in the yeah. And I want to say thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and I hope we have some time for some questions. Um, and uh, remember, take a humorous view of oneself, be gentle, kind, and patient with oneself. And we're learning. Every moment we're learning. And we're learning how to learn. We're also learning how to learn not to be unkind to ourselves. That's part of it. So thanks for letting me chew on your ear. And hopefully there's some questions. Thank you, Mindy. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sakiku. We actually do have some questions. We don't have very much time because we're actually technically over time right now, <laughs> but we do have a couple questions um, in the Q&A section. Um, uh, let's see here. So one is, are spasms in the feet that only occur when I lie down to sleep related to sarcoid-related arthritis? Cool. So that's going to take a little bit of... Um, discussion to tease apart, because remember, a lot of our symptoms are things that we tease apart. Um, well, what I can say in terms of physical activity, one important thing in physical activity is stretching. And is the muscle, in addition to contracting, the muscle needs to stretch to be its healthiest self. And if muscle is not stretching, sometimes we can experience spasm. So we need to stretch something just beyond its um, just beyond its comfortable length, just so it's like a kind of delicious stretch. Um, and so that we can relieve cramping. But again, cramping can be related to numbers of things. Um, if, they're, if it's particularly in one area of the body, it's good chance that it's related to needing to stretch that limb in the opposite direction. But Oftentimes we can feel it other places where we have large muscles and that can be an electrolyte disturbance like, for example, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Thank you. Um, so we do have a question around, um, uh, so one, one of our guests has pulmonary sarcoidosis, um, but has yeah. had a lot of fat fatigue and pain and their rheumatologist says it's not sarcoid as in like apparently the fatigue and pain is not caused by sarcoid because they don't have nodules on joints, um, but they don't have any explanation for joint pain. Can Is there um, a, a strategy for discussing this with the provider? Um, yeah. Well, sounds a bit like a second opinion type of deal. Um, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to get a second opinion. Um, 
nodules are not the only thing that cause pain and sarcoidosis. We get inflammation of the joints, sort of similar, like you can get in rheumatoid arthritis. And um, pain and fatigue are very much a part of the experience of sarcoidosis. Whether you have pulmonary disease or whether you have, or your disease is non-pulmonary pre predominant. And there's been enough studies to demonstrate that um, fatigue is a lingering thing that happens in all brands and all types of or presentations of sarcoidosis. Um, you know, in, in the scleroderma world, and I think we're moving towards this in the sarcoidosis world based on, um, I had a recent chat with, with Dr. Boffman over the weekend in a group. And in this scleroderma world, we're leaning towards if somebody has scleroderma, that they should be engaged in the scleroderma center with somebody that really understands the complexity and the subtleties of a condition. And, and I think we're moving towards that in sarcoidosis as well, because these sarcoidosis is, it can be overwhelming for a cl clinician who isn't seeing sarcoidosis all day long. And, and so we're there to support general rheumatologists, general pulmonologists. Um, and uh, we recently came out with a statement from the Scleroderma Foundation to, to, to state such that um, uh, scleroderma centers uh, the preferred mechanism of care is with the scleroderma center supporting local clinicians, including the rheumatologist, pulmonologist, cardiologist. Um, and, um, but it is very difficult strategies to, if, if one feels they're not being listened to, that's not a sustainable relationship. But if you, if one feels that they're, that the relationship can evolve um, and it's worth, worth continuing the relationship, I think a way to handle it would be, I read this and I felt um, that maybe our last meeting there, some of my symptoms were dismissed. Um, can we do better? Um, that's one, one way. I mean, we never want to burn bridges, but sometimes we have to move on, right? Thank you. Um, final question I'm gonna ask is, and you touched on this a little bit during the webinar, but um, it came up again. So uh, are there some, can you sort of point specifically to some ways to manage fear? For mm. instance, what if I suffocate and die? <laughs> Okay, so ways of managing fear. Well, I think one very important way is a practice over time, and it's a physical rhythmic practice over time. And like I keep alluding to the FSR video library, but there's gen gentle exercises and exercise in itself because most exercises, whatever you do, are rhythmic. Um, and so habituating that and strengthening that, fortifying that over time can really help. Um, there is a, um, and Mindy, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you something that was just sent out by the National Institute for blah, blah, blah. Uh, I forgot, trauma informed. <laughs> whatever. Anyway, but I'm going to send this out. It's a paradigm uh, of how to manage overwhelming anxiety. And, um, and it's a four box uh, kind of cartoon, but it walks you through um, how to get from a high state of anxiety to a lower state of anxiety. And, um, and I think I've already said that there are some practical tools on the FSR website as well. Um, yeah, this is, and you know, I will say um, a few years ago, which was supported by Rodney Reese's organization, the Sarcoidosis Awareness Foundation of Louisiana, 
supported the development of um, Dying Well workshop that we did um, in New Orleans and Louisiana, and many people came to this workshop. You know, and one of the things about living is we often, while we live, carry the anxiety of dying. But life, in a way, is a practice for death sometimes. If you look at things in a, perhaps a Buddhist uh, philosophy, I mean, and even if we look at the Judeo-Christian uh, tenets, we can see that there's um, harkings to, to practicing. And uh, we all are going to die sometime. We worry about how we're going to die. Is it going to be painful? Is it going to be suffocating? Is it going to be, and again, um, I think some of the things that I've learned over the past years from my own personal experiences, born of my own fears, um, having made the journey with family members, loved patients, um, is that practicing some of these things that we are talking about, habituation, practicing um, being anxious and moving into another place and practicing this physical alignment with one's breath, the gorgeous, delicious sensation of one's breath and one's movement, um, uh, the body sensation of the breath. Um, these are things that can carry us and these are the things that are often used in end of life um, to, to have an easier passing. And again, some of the skills that we were talking about earlier in communication, those are skills that can also help us when we're in end of life, to help us communicate when we're in pain or feel numb. And um, most, um, Definitely a difficult topic, but it's on all of our minds a lot of the time. And so not to be too heavy, but I, I think we're addressing an elephant in the room. So thanks for that brilliant question and all of these brilliant questions, which are really spot on. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, FSR. Thank you, Dr. Takaku. And thank you to our audience for coming and seeking it out. And it was a yes. great presentation. <laughs> and I will be sending the video version of this out with some of the links that Dr. Sakaku mentions throughout the presentation. Um, so you guys have those. And don't forget to sign up for our next session, which is January 6th, I believe, Thursday, January 6th, for the third installment of our checklist, which is about- Whatever that is, whatever the name of it is, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I called it the uh, empowered patient um, about how to, uh, to really lean into empowerment in your healthcare. And um, Dr. Sakaku will lead us on in that discussion next time in January. So we will see you in the next year. Everybody have a really nice holiday season um, and we will see you then. Thank you so much, Dr. Sakaku. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, everybody. It was wonderful having a great audience. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.